Can you give it up for all those that are joining with us right now online for the first time? Come on, give it up for them. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining with us. And listen, we want you to feel the connection of the people in this house. And the best way to do that is if you're in the Dothan area to just show up and be part of our services. And uh, we want to make sure that you feel that connection. And can you give it up for those that are joining with us in the room for the first time? Come on, give it up for our first time guests in the house. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining with us. Go ahead, grab your copy of God's Word. Say this with me. Say, I am what God's Word says I am. I can do what God's Word said I can do. I can become all that God said I can be. So today... I'll hear God's word, I'll receive God's word, and I'll obey God's word because I love his word. Now just turn to the person next to you and just tell them, hey, look, it may be raining outside, but it's dry in here, and we're thankful for it. Yeah, we're, we're so glad. <laughs> I, um, I want to tell you a very quick story. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid... Uh, my friend and I used to love to play basketball, and um, this was in the era of Michael Jordan, and um, so I, I watched him do all these amazing dunks, but we wanted to be able to do that too, but there was no earthly way as kids that we were ever going to be able to dunk a basketball. Eventually, eventually we grew up, and it worked, and we were able to dunk a basketball, but but back then, we were just so small. I mean, you know, we just wanted to have fun. And my friend had a ramp. He had a big ramp. And so we decided that it would be really intelligent of us, if we're going to dunk a basketball, that we'd run up that ramp and dunk the basketball. Well, that was great until my friend decided that as he ran, he hung on just a little too long. His body swung out about this far. His fingers released from that rim as he went sideways, fell straight down, uh, broke out his two front teeth and broke both of his arms. Yeah, I know, I was there. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a really bad situation. They called the, the paramedics and the ambulance came out and picked him up and, of course, set the wrist. But it was during the school year. And, um, you know, you find out who your real friends are when you have to carry your friend's books around from class to class, you know? I mean, seriously, that's, that's a really good friend. But I'll tell you, when you really know who your friends are is when you've got two broken arms, you've got to go to the bathroom and you can't unbuckle your belt. Let me tell you something, that's a real friend. And that's as far as I was going to go with my friend. I'll tell you that. Buckling the belt. <laughs> Whatever happens after you get in that stall is up to you, my friend. You better work it out, homeboy, because that's as far, <laughs> as far as our friendship goes. How many of you know we need good friends? <laughs> Godly friends. Friends that will help us in times of need. And we're going to talk today about the blessing of relationship. The importance of godly friends. And friends, I, I want to give you some practical advice to words to live by today that one of the greatest blessings in life is the opportunity to make friends. And listen, if you don't learn how to do it early and often, eventually you're going to end up incredibly lonely. I've heard it said, well, I don't have time. You know, I'm too busy to try to make friends. Well, then you're too busy because life is about building relationships. Jesus talked about it over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, he talks about in the scriptures, God speaks of himself as a friend that sticks closer than a blood brother. Think about that. That, that, that he sticks so close. And the reason that he says that is because he desires for us to be that kind of close family. Matter of fact, I found in the Christian life that there are family and, and, and then there's the family of God. Do you know what I mean when I say that? I, I'm not against family and blood family and relatives and those that, you know, share Thanksgiving meals with you and all that. And I think that's wonderful. That's awesome. But I, I've got friends in my life 
And many, many of you know and have the same experience that it's like your church family is so close. They're there when you need them, even more sometimes than our own blood family. But the Bible talks so much about, matter of fact, it's a topic that is covered more than just about any other subject is the subject of relationships. Proverbs 18, 24 says there's a friend that sticks closer than a, blo bro than a blood brother. But Jesus, think about this. He felt that it was so important. He covered the masses, right? He, he built relationship with the masses. But the Bible says over and over again, he got away with 12. He hung out with those 12. And then it goes a step further and says he hung out with three. That he had a group of three that he felt so comfortable, so connected, so close with, that he built that firm foundation of relationship. Let, let me tell you something. If Jesus, the Messiah, needed friends, how much more do we need friends in the body of Christ? Turn to Romans chapter 1, if you will, please. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the, why we need these relationships, why we need good friends. Romans chapter 12 is, talks about it. We need spiritual encouragement. Here's what it says. Romans chapter 1 verse 12 says, I want us to help each other. Everybody say help each other. Help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. I talk about this all the time, but Jesus, my favorite passage, as you know, in the scriptures, Jesus talked about this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've got to love God, but you've got to also learn how to love people. Amen. And that's the harder of the two because God's perfect. He's easier to love than our neighbor next door or our friend down the street. Sometimes they're flawed and they, well, they are flawed. And guess what? Just when you think you're so great, you got to realize you're flawed as well. We need to learn how to love flawed friends, even here in the body of Christ. You know, the words uh, one another is used 58 times in the New Testament. There's 58 commands that you could not fulfill all by yourself. Love one another, support one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, serve one another. Over and over and over again, it talks about the building of a relationship that a New Testament church would not just be founded only on the faith in Christ, but the mutual relationship, the faith that we mutually share in Christ. You need friendships for spiritual growth, for development. You need it for emotional support. How many of you know we have issues that we've got to work out and we need friends to come alongside us when we're going through some stuff? Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Friends, life is a journey and you need real friends that love you and can share life with you. Now, there's two types of people in the world. There's taking people and there's giving people. And I want you to know, you need both in your relationships. You, you, don't, you, you don't need just the, the giving people in your life. You need the taking people as well because you need to learn how to give away love, right, to those who are needy. But you also need to learn how to have giving friends because if you only have taking friends all the time, guess what? You get depleted over time. You need somebody that pours back into your life. I encourage you to find mentoring relationships, people you can mentor and people that look up to you, right? And also the kind of relationship where they, someone else mentors you because you're in need. Are you following this? You need to learn how to both give and receive. Taking people will challenge you, but giving people can motivate you. And God wired us with the need for community. That's why in the earliest book, when, these, when, when God made man in his own image, in his own likeness, in a perfect place in the garden, yet he was all by himself, and God said, that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. He needed to make a helper suitable, and that wasn't just about marriage. It was about building relationships. You need good friends, by the way, for physical health and healing. I want you to know that science and God's word line up when it comes to the significance and the importance of building relationships. It literally says that those who have good, solid, healthy, wholesome, close relationships, that they actually live longer. You want to cut your life short? Be alone. Be alone. <laughs> James chapter 5 verse 16 says, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
Listen, if you want to be forgiven by God, then you repent and you go to God and you confess it to God. But when you want healing, when you want to unload the positive and negative emotions and release them and get true healing, it comes when you get accountable. And when you build those kinds of loving relationships, you need good friends just to laugh and cry for the social enjoyment. Listen, life was not meant to be endured. It was meant to be enjoyed. And so sharing your life with other people, God wired you with a need to be able to enjoy life with other folks. Nothing can compensate for the lack of good relationships. Man, you could achieve all there is to achieve and make all the money in the world and have all the fame and success in the world. But if you don't have good friends, let me tell you something. When, when your relationships aren't good, life just isn't good. Faithful friendships. Matter of fact, I, I need faithful friends to help me complete God's assignment for my life. You want to accomplish something great? It takes friendship and teamwork, growing and developing together. You want to grow in Christ? You've got to learn how to have a friend that can look at you and be honest with you. You'll never fulfill God's plan all by yourself. God gave you friends to fulfill his goals. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says it like this. Two people are better than one because they get more done. Everybody say, get more done. <laughs> they get more done by working together. And friends, the best friends I've ever made have been serving with somebody in a ministry in a church. That's the fastest and best and quickest way, most fulfilling way. Or in a life group. That's, that's some of the best ways. I found out more during the pandemic about the significance of relationships than I ever had before that point. All of the issues that come up, the crisis counseling that took place during that season because we, were, we had a void in our life of connected relationships. I believe you can find, in my opinion, the best, highest quality connected people the best character people in a church. I really believe that. So how do we make good friends? Well, Jesus taught the, what we call the golden rule, right? Matthew 7, 12. Okay, this is, a, this is something you should teach your kids growing up. Look, let me just stop and say this to all parents in the house. And if you don't mind me saying, especially moms, although moms and dads both can get into this scenario. Uh, when you're teaching your kids how to handle things on the playground because there's going to be conflict. There's going to be controversy in their life at some point relationally. Do not stir up drama as a parent and make like every other child is bad and your child is awesome. Amen. Let me tell you something. You know what you're doing if you do that? You may be making yourself feel good and your child feel good for a short period of time, but you know what? You're teaching them how to isolate themselves and not learn positive, healthy introspection and conflict resolution. Yes, and everybody said amen to that, those of you parents. I'm going to talk about in the, this series, uh, building healthy parent, parenting skills and marriage, uh, how to have healthy and strong and, and build healthy marriages. We're going to talk about that over the days to come, Lord willing. But you need to treat other people the way you want to be treated. Here it is, the golden rule. Do for others what you would like for them to do for you. This is the essence of all that's taught in the law and the prophets. Friends, you'll never receive what you're unwilling to give. Let me say that again. You'll never receive what you're unwilling to give. If you want deep, healthy, meaningful relationships, then you have to give that away. Be the friend that you would like to have, right? You attract who you are, okay? Like, it, listen, if you are shallow, you're going to attract shallow people. If you're a loving person, you're going to attract loving people. If you are a bitter person, you're going to attract bitter people. If you're, going, if you're a gossip, you're going to attract gossips in your life. I'm just telling you, you have to become a great friend in order to have good friends. So how do I make those deep, meaningful relationships? Well, it takes time. 
You're going to have to put in the time and the effort. You've got to choose to invest the time and the effort to make those good friendships, those relationships. And there is something called relationship maintenance. And it's no different than those of you who drive cars. You've got to put gasoline in the car. You've got to have oil changes. You've got to have regular maintenance on that vehicle. And so it is with, with relationships. Look, you could have a Ferrari sitting in your driveway, but if you never put any gas, it's not going anywhere. And so it is with some of the greatest friendships, some of the greatest relationships you have in your life with no maintenance, with no relational connection, with no time investment, without building a relationship, you really only have just simply a foundation of the possibility of a good friendship. Deep relationships are not accidental, they're intentional. And you need to be able to sow seeds of deep friendships. They're not instant they take time to develop. They take years to, to build. But no friendship's going to flourish without sacrifice. Relationships just flat out cost us something. You got to be there as a real friend. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man that has friends must first show himself friendly. Everybody say, show himself friendly. You got to be friendly first. You, you, and, and listen, let me just stop and say this. You may think you're friendly, <laughs> Matter of fact, you may think you present yourself well, but my encouragement would be to you, get married because your spouse may be the only one that's honest enough with you to just look at you and go, you are awkward. You are just, you've got to learn how to be nice, put a smile on your face, stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you and start being good at asking questions about other people. You know what's funny? People come into church and they think it's all about them. Oh, I hope somebody compliments my outfit. Or I hope somebody thinks this about me. I wonder what everybody's thinking about me. Nobody's thinking about you. First of all, they should be thinking about Jesus. Second of all, if they're like you, they're probably thinking about themselves as well. You get overloaded with all of your stuff and all of your mentality and all. Uh, it's all about you. And, and listen, if you want friends, you got to learn how to be selfless not selfish. Stop waiting for people to be your friend. You be their friend. You know what? If somebody just shows up in your life only when they need something, <laughs> that's called a fair weather friend, right? They're here today, gone tomorrow. And let me stop and say this. People on social media are not your friends. Look, I, they friended you, friended that's just a click of a button. It cost them nothing. And you know why some of them friended you? Because they wanted you to friend them back so they could have more likes and more followers. Just being honest, man. I, the friends in my life, I could call at a moment's notice. I could be uh, stranded in a desert somewhere and they'd fly to come get me. There's just, and you know why I know that? Because I've done some of those things sacrificially for them. I know that they would return that favor. Philippians 2, 4 says it like this. Don't be interested only in your own life. Be interested in the lives of others. Man, if you follow that verse, you'll have more friends than you know what to do with. Practice being interested in other people. Practice that. To build relationships, it takes time and it takes trust. You got to learn it takes time to develop trust. But that's what makes a friendship. Trust is what makes... You can't have a relationship that you, of, with someone you don't really trust. Right? You can talk to acquaintances, but you trust true friends. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 says, Many people claim to be a loyal friend, but it's rare. Have I say it's rare? <laughs> it's rare to find someone who's trustworthy. People don't give trust automatically. You've got to earn it. And the Bible says you can earn people's trust in a number of ways. The first way is just be consistent, be reliable, be predictable, be somebody you can count on. Keep your word, right? That's the difference. That reliability and consistency is what is the difference between a friend and a flake. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about flakes? People in your life that are just kind of flaky, right? The only way I like flakes is frosted in a bowl for breakfast. I'm just telling you, I'm not down with the flakes. 
I like you. Oh, I don't like you. You did this, so I don't like you anymore. Oh, no, you did this, so I like you. That's flaky, man. Here today, gone tomorrow, flaky and fickle. That's not a real friend. Proverbs 17. Oh, wait, let's just stop and say this. Those people that say, I like you only when you do this for me. That's manipulation. That's not friendship. I'm preaching better than y'all are letting on, but this is really, the second part of this is really going to help you if the first part didn't. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves you most of the time. (laughs) A friend loves you all the time, man, when you're sick, when you're struggling, when you're stressed. The two greatest abilities are reliability and dependability. Two greatest abilities. So you trust people because they're consistent and they're predictable and they're also loyal to you. They're loyal. Loyalty is a term we don't hear very often. We, there's no loyalty in the job market today, and there certainly doesn't seem to be loyalty in church life. It just the, the, There's a lack of loyalty among friendships. I don't understand it. Loyalty is the opposite of self-centeredness and narcissism. It's loyalty's love in action. It's giving sacrificially. It's loyalty says, I'm going to help you before I help myself. Another translation of Proverbs 17 says it like this. A true friend is always loyal. Everybody say always loyal. And a brother is born to help in a time of need. That's a choice. It's a choice to remain committed when your friend is sick or stressed or needs help. Are you loyal to anybody? Really loyal to anybody? Ask yourself, are you really loyal to anybody? Loyalty means they can't get to one of us without going through all of us. That's what loyalty is. Proverbs 19.22 says, loyalty makes a person attractive. Look, I, you could try to fix up your hair and your makeup if you're a lady, or you could put on the, your own clo- the special kind of clothes or whatever. Nothing makes you more attractive to people than the loyalty that you give to them. That's what the Bible says. They'll look past your flaws to see your loyalty. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 talks about love. It's the love chapter. It's, you probably heard this if you've been to a wedding, this particular passage, but it says this, if you love someone, you'll be loyal to them no matter what the cost. You'll always believe in them, always expect the best of them, and always stand your ground in defending them. Let me talk to those of you who in a relationship, whether in a church setting or maybe in a Uh, a marital setting or in a friendship setting with a close friend, if you've been betrayed or abandoned or manipulated or abused or controlled, you may have some trust issues that you're dealing with. And for that, I want you to know it doesn't just break my heart, it breaks God's heart on your behalf. I'm sorry that you've walked through those experiences And I want you to know, as sad as it is, it's not as few and far between as we'd like to believe. It it happens often. And so what do we do with those things? Well, first of all, yes, we go to God with those things. But also, it makes it harder to trust a new friend that you're trying to establish. Sometimes it takes a little extra time. Sometimes it takes a little extra work and counseling. And we believe in, in healthy, godly counsel, biblical counsel. Yes, we believe in prayer, and, and, but, but you may need to be mentored into a new uh, relationship or you need to have coaching in your life. You know, uh, athletes, some of the best athletes have coaches. <laughs> some of the best vocalists have training coaches, vocal coaches. Some of the best CEOs have coaches. We may need to have some relationship coaches in our life. Look at the people in life that seem to have good relationships And then ask them, you know, how do you do that? How do you become good at that? Have you ever, and I guarantee you, even those people that have been good at relationships have been burned once or twice and they had to learn how to be vulnerable again. I'm just saying. You can earn it by being trustworthy and loyal and and, and especially keeping confidence. Let me tell you this, friends. Sadly, the church is known around the world for being gossipy. 
I'll never fully understand why we can't seem to keep confidences with one another. If they've got HIPAA laws that restrict people in the counseling world or in the medical community to just keep your mouth shut, how many understand if they can make laws to keep you, make you keep your mouth shut, how come we can't use the laws of God's word to tell, tell us keep our mouths shut? Do you know that's one of the seven things God hates? It's right up there with murder is gossip. And sometimes it's is just as deadly or as damaging as physical murder because gossip is like it murders over and over and over again people's character. It's the assassination of someone's character. Can I share anything with someone and know that they're not going to blab it? You need a safe, confidential person you can share things with. Your, your doubts and your fears and your issues some of the worst ways you feel about yourself, you need to be able to release those and share those. Proverbs eleven thirteen says, a true friend will keep a secret, right? They're not going to blab it. The Good News translation in that particular passage in Proverbs eleven thirteen says like this, no one who gossips can be trusted, but you can put your confidence, everybody say confidence, in someone who's trustworthy. By the way, if somebody gossips to you, just know they're going to gossip about you. Just know that, right? People with integrity talk to people, not about people. Trust takes years to build and seconds to destroy because of gossip. If you want to build a relationship, by the way, you have to not only listen and learn how to listen and keep your mouth closed and not gossip to others, but you also need to listen with empathy. This is very hard for some people. Empathy is just putting yourself in someone else's shoes, right? Those of us that struggle a little bit with ADD where we're talking to somebody and all of a sudden, squirrel, you know, and you're just like, you know, all over the place. You know, I get that. The hardest thing for me, honest, honestly, the hardest thing for me is in church because I, I realize as a pastor, I want to be friendly with everyone and someone might be talking to me right here and I'm in, trying to engage in that conversation and somebody comes up beside me and taps me on the shoulder. Hey, and hey, hey, hey. And before too long, I'm haying and, and I'm not paying attention. <laughs> or you know what the worst thing uh, is, is when we're thinking more about what we're going to say next than we are listening to the person that's trying to tell us something meaningful right? That we're losing the engagement of conversation. How many know uh, l saying you're listening, but really hearing yeah. two different things, right? James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. And by the way, if you do these first two, the third comes a little more easily is that, and then slow to get angry, right? Listening with emp empathy, feeling with the feelings that they're feeling. Now, Let's just, I'm gonna, I will, I'll table this conversation for another time when I talk about marriage, but let me just stop and say this quickly, is that husbands, you need to learn something about women. I know us guys, we, we are fixers by nature. We want to fix things, and our spouses tell us things, our wives tell us things, and it, it, listen, if they would just listen to our advice their whole life would be so easy and fixed so quickly. <laughs> but do you know your wife wants you to just listen and zip it and they don't want you to fix it. They just want you to pay attention to what they're saying and feel with their feelings. And I don't like it. Because I want to fix it. But this is such good advice. <laughs> this will save your marriage. How many of you husbands been there? Come on, somebody. Yeah, the rest of y'all are liars. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Romans 15, 2, before I get in trouble. Romans 15, 2, you must bear the burden of being considerate. Everybody say considerate considerate of the doubts and feelings of others. You know, everybody deals with doubts and, and fears. We need to learn how to be considerate, sympathetic, thoughtful, kind, relational, emotional, understanding, patient, attentive, all of these things, supportive. Job 6.14 brings out 
something that's probably you didn't even know was in the Bible. But this is a tough one right here. A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Have you ever had a moment in your life where a prayer didn't get answered or a disappointment hit you so hard right between the eyes that you actually wondered, what do I believe about God? And if you've never experienced anything like that, hey, thank God. Thank God you've never experienced it. But I'm just going to tell you, for the majority of us, we've had moments in our life that are so despairing, so discouraging, so disheartening, so broken that there comes a point where you just, it, it, it's a flash that comes across your mind of, dear God, are you really there? You're going to have friends in your life that go through disappointments or issues of life. And they may even question their own theology that you collectively believed. That's not the time to kick them to the curb. That's the time to love them through what they're going through. And listen, I, I have to tell you, as a pastor, and, and I understand a lot about my doctrine and theology and about what God, God's word have to say, has to say, but you know what? If somebody's mama just died or somebody's daddy just died or they just miscarried a child or lost a baby or something horrific or tragic or ha have been molested or burned in some way or, or hurt in a local church or whatever, that's not the time to just pour out three sermons, three points, and a poem and take up an offering. Come on, somebody. That's the time to Sit and listen and love someone through their pain. I, I understand the desire to correct someone's flawed theology. And there will, be at, there will be a time for that. Where you can coach them lovingly through the word of God. But all, you have to have such grace when you communicate it. You've got to be so careful when you share it. The Bible says even when people are hurting so bad they don't know what they believe, they deserve the devotion of a loyal friend. The Bible says that we need to be loyal friends, not judgmental friends when people go through doubt. Everyone needs a safe place where they can go when they have a struggle or if their prayer doesn't get answered. And one of the other ways we build relationships is just accepting each other's shortcomings when there's problems or flaws, that we still love them, even in the flaws and the faults and the failings and the weaknesses and even people's sins. Friends, nobody's perfect. Romans 15, 7 says it like this, accept each other. Here it is, just as Christ. Everybody say, just as Christ. Just as Christ accepted you, then God will be glorified. Man, God showed you grace. Can you show anybody else some grace? God showed you love unconditionally. Can you show anybody else some love? You're going to find flaws in, if you're married, you're going to find flaws in your mate. I want you to know, I know, it's hard to believe. But there are flaws in me. I know, it's crazy, right? Ask her about them. Can you believe that? Flaws in me. What are the odds? Yeah, of course, just like everybody else. And you know what? The best thing you can do is overlook those flaws and remind yourself how amazing they really are. What attracted to, you the, to them in the first place? What makes them so different and so great and so unique and so wonderful and such an awesome child of God that you just can't wait to get connected back with them? It's overlooking some of those things. You know what we often do is... We, oh, we put our magnifying glass on all the good things while we're dating or engaged. And then we put our, our, you know, we put our magnifying glass now on all the flaws and faults, all the ways we want somebody to change. Well, you're not so hot yourself, homeboy. Let me tell you, you've got to get over yourself and love people. Proverbs 17, 9 says, overlooking a person's faults cultivates love. Overlooking a, a person's faults cultivates love. Here it is, but nagging. Everybody say, but nagging. <laughs> but nagging about them destroys friendships and marriages and relationships. And by the way, if you have friends in your sphere of influence 
that when you have a dispute with your spouse and you go talk to them and they get on your side and start talking, you need to lead him. You need to, don't mess with that girl. I mean, she crazy, you know, don't mess with that, her, you know. If you're not, pull, listen, if they're not pulling your marriage together, they're pulling your marriage apart. You've got to have friends that'll just give of themselves to show God's love to help you in your marriage. You need to learn how to celebrate the wins and share the losses. And worship team, if you come as we prepare to close, Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. You need to learn how to celebrate the good in other people without becoming envious, jealous, resentful, or competitive with your friends. Listen, if you're only celebrating the good stuff that happens to you, you're going to have a pretty lonely life. But when you can learn how to celebrate people in there, when they get a, a good job or when they get a promotion or when they get a new car or a new house or they get married or they're having children or whatever, even if those blessings aren't happening to you, you need to learn how to love them and celebrate their wins. You also need to be there and share their losses. It's harder to do that sometimes when you're having a good day and they're having a bad one. But let me tell you, in funerals, in financial loss, in job loss, in health issues, in chronic pain, people need godly friends. Be there for them in grief and in struggle. Send them texts or emails or however you communicate, phone calls or go out to coffee with them and just listen to them and love them. Love them through hard conversations. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says it like this. If one part of the body suffers, everybody say suffers. All the parts share in its suffering. But if one part is praised, all the others share in its happiness. You know, my best friends bring the best out in me. And we need people. We need best friends. We need good friends because best friends bring, bring the best out in you. I couldn't be what I've become without close relationships. Proverbs 27, 17 says, just as an iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another friend. Proverbs 24, 26 is an, an honest answer is a sign of true friendship. Have you given anybody access to be truly honest with you? And tell you the truth. Do you have, have you given anybody the freedom to get up in your face and be honest and tell you, you got your breath stinks, take a mint. Come on, somebody. That's a friend that's a lifesaver right there in the real deal. Faithful friends. Friends that'll tell you they, that they love you too much to watch you mess up the way you're messing up your life. And that you don't just kick them to the curb just because you don't want to hear what they have to say. Or are you afraid of being confronted by the truth? Proverbs 27, 5, a truly good friend will openly correct you. You know, critics advise from a spirit of rejection, but true faithful friends advise from a spirit of acceptance. You don't have to take truth or a truth from someone you don't trust. I get that. But faithful friends will nourish your spirit. They, they help you to grow when you need growing. They'll find humor even in the middle of difficulty to help you to laugh in the middle of your tears and help you understand the whole world's really not falling apart. It's just one moment, one season, one time. Faithful friends you can cry with. They'll cry with you. They'll encourage you. They'll strengthen you. They'll lift your burdens. They'll invest their time, their energy, their effort in you. They'll listen to you. They'll celebrate you. There was a study that was done not too long ago in a, a church life, and it says they discovered that only half the people in churches say they have any significant relationships at all. But people in small groups 90% of people in small groups say they have significant relationships. Friends, that's why we've got those life groups out there. That's why we've got freedom groups and life groups and ministries. We've got so many ministries in this church to get connected and involved with. The reason we do that is because loneliness breaks the heart of God. And it breaks my heart to think that even one person in this room could be in a room this size with, size with such amazing people and still feel lonely inside. But you've got to make an investment if you're ever going to reap a return. 
I'm going to challenge you to do some things intentionally as we close out the service. Is I want you to intentionally make a friendship. Enlarge your circle. Look for ways to be friendly. The second thing I want you to do intentionally is mend a friendship. Those of you that are, have uh, it, friends, some issues going on, and I get it. Listen, there's some you know, issues that, that are just, you don't want to let them back in the circle. And I understand that if it's a toxic relationship, but there may be friends out there that you've wounded and affected and you need to apologize and be humble. And then you need to nurture a friendship to really value the friends that you have in your life, to cultivate friendships. When's the last time you thanked God for your friends? When's the last time you thanked your friends for being a friend, right? Proverbs 12, 26 says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. So I wanna, I wanna just review as I'm kind of closing out today. The fastest way, in my opinion, to meet quality people is to serve alongside of them because they have like heart. They do, they have a like heart, right? In kids ministry or youth ministry or whatever, they, they have a like heart. So immediately you're gonna feel drawn and connected. But then also, to get involved in a life group is you begin to find people of like interests where they enjoy doing the same things that you like. And it can all be summed up in a phrase that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you follow that command, you'll not only have blessed relationships, but at the end of your life, you won't be lonely, you'll be loved. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the opportunity we have in this house to create deep and lasting and trustworthy friendships. And I pray that we would become a church that's known as being that type of friend. That we don't gossip or backbite or feel competition with one another, but that we lovingly encourage and support and, and, and that we, we keep our mouths closed when someone shares information about their lives, their doubts, their fears. And when people go through difficulty, that we don't judge them, but that we would love them through it. God, help us to be supportive, godly friends. Matter of fact, in this room, with heads bowed and eyes closed, there may be some that you just say, Mark, I need to turn my life over to the friend that sticks closer than a brother. There may be some in this room that you'd say, honestly, Mark, if I'm being true, <laughs> Jesus really needs to be that, that, that close friend in my life because maybe you've sinned and separated yourself from God in some way or maybe you've turned your back on him or maybe you've been living in a way that doesn't reflect God's word or God's will or God's plan or God's purpose for your life or, or maybe for you, you've just been distant from God. You need to come back to him. He loves you with an everlasting love. And if that's you in this room, I'm not here to embarrass you. It's not my heart to judge you. I simply want to invite you into relationship with the only one who can truly make you free, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. At this moment, I'm going to invite you to simply slip up your hand. And by the acknowledgement of that raised hand, all you're doing is saying, Pastor, include me in this prayer right now. If that's you all over this place, yes, God bless you. Anybody else? Yeah. Just include me in this. Yes, God bless you. Anybody else? Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, in the balcony, down below, under the balcony, on the main floor. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. A number of hands that have gone up. You can put your hands down, but I want to pray for you. First, I want to pray over you that you could be a godly friend to others. And, and you need to position yourself to be a good and godly friend, even if you've created some real bad choices in your life because you never were taught how to be a good friend. You now have the ammunition, the tools to learn how to be a good friend. I'm gonna pray over you right now to be a good and godly friend. Lord, in this room, I pray in Jesus' name, we would be good and godly and wholesome and faithful friends who learn how to do biblical things and take biblical action and learn how to be loving and supportive and encouraging and uh, celebrate people and invest our time and be trustworthy. Lord, teach us how to be godly friends, how to be Christian friends, how to be loyal and faithful friends. Now, I want you to pray this prayer. Everyone in the room, pray this prayer out loud after me. Would you pray this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I repent 
for all I've done wrong. I believe that you died and rose again for me. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for challenging me. And thank you for changing me. I choose to trust you with every area of my life. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you stand up all over this house and give God the praise? Come on, can we do that? Yeah, let's worship the King together. Lead us in worship today. Thank you, Jesus. today, make us faithful, loving, and supportive friends. Whether it's through life groups and freedom groups, or if it's taking people out to lunch after service, or if it's uh, greeting and meeting people intention with intentionality, or if it's being quiet when someone shares a doubt or a fear, or if it's just going out of our way to, to serve someone else. Help us to be loyal and faithful friends. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to dismiss some of our leaders right now to head out toward the, the front. And uh, they, they're going to greet you and connect with you. Those that are first-time guests in the house, we've got a guest reception prepared just for you right after the service. It's out the doors and to your left. And you'll see that uh, big old sign that says guest reception. We just want to give you a gift for hanging out with us. If you'll take just a few moments and stop by there, some of our leaders will be waiting on you to connect with you and hang out with you. Listen, I want to release you with a blessing, but before I do, I want to remind you of two things. The very first one is that we have something called Grow Track, and we're doing something special called Day to Discover. We're doing one day of our Grow Track after, uh, after a service. It's not this Sunday, but it's in a couple of weeks. You can sign up. There's already a number that have already signed up, but you can use the connection cards to sign up, or you can just call our church office and let us know. The main reason we want to know and have you sign up is because we're going to provide a meal and we want to make sure that everyone that shows up has a meal, okay? So that's why we ask you to sign up. So please do that. Sign up for our Grow Track, our Day to Discover. It's going to be in a couple of weeks after our morning service. The other thing I want to remind you is out in the foyer is all these life groups and our freedom class groups. If you want to sign up for those, you can read about them, find out more about them, and then sign your name. Let us know you're going to be a part of them. Build relationships. Let me release you with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and bring you peace. And may the Lord our God write his name on your heart and declare you're my children. No one can take you from my hand. May you know the love of your Savior that came and died for you and rescued you. And may you give that love away to as many as humanly possible. I bless you to be a blessing to your family and your friends and your co-workers and those in your sphere of influence. I bless you to bless other people and to be a blessing while you're building relationships. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of today? I pray you did. Hey, God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you this Wednesday or next Sunday. God bless you. You're dismissed.